Evening, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Haldane from the Bank of England. Uh, easy to spot. I'm the one wearing a tie uh, this evening. Um, it's very nice to be here, actually. Um, usually when I speak, there isn't much applause or um, <laughs> whooping or hollowing. So very nice to see that this evening. And please don't hold back But when I finish. <laughs> So that was me. Um, uh, let me start by congratulating the, auth uh, congratulating the authors, uh, Joe and Kahal and Zach. Um, delighted to be here uh, launching this challenging book and only right that we are challenging, actually, the profession uh, and economic policy policymakers like me. Um, so a generation ago, uh, the famous American, very famous American economist, um, John Kenneth Galbraith, observed, economics is extremely useful as a form of employment for economists. <laughs> and that rather damning indictment continues, unfortunately, to ring rather too true, because the, the global financial crisis has, I think, genuinely spawned uh, a crisis in the economics and finance uh, profession. Not the first one. Uh, Jeff mentioned that back in the 30s, economics faced another existential crisis, and Keynes rode to the rescue. Uh, this time's crisis, this time's challenge, is every uh, bit as great. And I think this book is welcome, particularly as a call to arms in rising to that challenge. And the book is asking big questions, big questions of economics and of economic policy. And both are at their best when they are being debated, not just among experts, but within wider society, including here in this room this evening. And this book, I think, very helpfully paves the way for some of those broader societal discussions. So what's the essence? of the book's critique of economics and of economic policy. We've heard some of that already. Let me give you uh, my take. Uh, what's clear is that the critique is very much broader than the technical. This isn't just about the fact that the workhorse model in economics proved to be lame when it came to running a real crisis race. The deeper critique is that these models, and as importantly, the language that accompanies them, have played a role in policy, a role in society, which has been disproportionate. Disproportionate relative to our state of knowledge. In other words, too much weight has been placed on the shoulders of economics, given the fragilities in our existing models and understanding. But also disproportionate in the role these models and frameworks have played in framing choices in society. This is the essence of the econocracy, if you like. So economics, if you like, has been both too narrow in its technical focus and too broad in its societal impact. So let me take those two critiques, if I could, uh, in turn. The first, I'd say the least contentious, at least now, is that mainstream economics has become too narrow and singular, if you like, too much of a monoculture. As with any monoculture, the results of that can be catastrophic when, as during the crisis, the single crop fails. And one aspect of that monoculture has been the focus on elegant mathematics at the expense of the messy realities of the real world. The study of mathematics has brought rigor to economics. Unfortunately, it has also brought mortis. <laughs> Now, I wish that quote was mine, uh, and I'm very tempted to pass it off as my own. It's actually Robert Heilbronner's. Uh, but for this evening, let's say it's mine. Um, so another aspect of the monoculture is the narrowness 
of the curriculum. We've heard a lot about the curriculum already this evening. We've seen by turns a neglect of the disciplines that abut and illuminate economics, history and anthropology and sociology and psychology and sociology and moral philosophy. In short, a neglect of the very things that make economics interesting and economic policy important. From my personal view, is this element of the critic is an entirely fair one. And I don't even think these days it's a particular source of controversy, even within large parts of the profession. And encouragingly, since the crisis, we have seen progress on this front, including on reform of the curriculum. This mini revolution, I agree, has been rather slow moving. It's proceeded, as usual, at funereal place, obituary by obituary. <laughs> but that question is further to go, perhaps much further. But I think now it's a question of how far and how fast economics reforms itself, rather than whether and when. And that reform effort has, without question, been given impetus by the efforts initiated by students at Manchester several years ago, three of whom, of course, are here tonight as authors of this book. That initiative now has global reach among a network of universities. I wanted tonight to applaud that effort, as I did, as I first did, actually, back in 2000. And 14, it and initiatives like it, I think, are crucial. Crucial in ensuring that the intellectual endowment of the crisis, that is to say, increased interest in the subject, increased student numbers doing the subject, a higher media and political profile for economics, that's the best way of investing wisely that very rich endowment. So second element of the critique, which in some ways flows from the first, is that the language used by economists has served as a barrier to debate and to understanding, particularly on the part of the general public. Now, every profession has its jargon. So why pick on economics? Well, the contention here is that economics has, in a way, become a victim of its own Success, economic principles, as we've heard, have found their way into every nook and cranny of public discourse and public policy. And if economics is indeed shaping society so fundamentally, it's reasonable, I'd say, to argue that it has a particular responsibility to explain itself clearly and intelligibly to all the people it is serving, which could mean everyone. In the words of the authors, economics is for everyone. I think this critique also has considerable force. For example, in a rare moment of introspection recently, I looked at my own speeches and measured their linguistic complexity and was rather horrified that they ranked well above the levels of your average broadsheet and, and way above the levels of your av average tabloid uh, newspaper. In other words, they were like to be inaccessible to the vast majority of the population. I reckon mine aren't even accessible to that 12% you mentioned uh, <laughs> earlier on. And that matters, I think, a lot. That matters a lot. Unlike in the past, the general public these days isn't willing to take arguments on trust unless they're expressed in an accessible form. If you do the same linguistic analysis, not of my speeches, but of Donald Trump's, as some academics have, do have, fa have done, you find something very interesting. They stand out in their linguistic simplicity even relative to every previous US presidential candidate. I don't think that's an irrelevant fact when trying to make sense of the events of the last two weeks or so. 
And to remedy matters, I mean, some have proposed improved programs of public understanding of economics, and that's certainly worthwhile. We've heard about a few this evening already. But it'd be arrogant, I think, of the profession to assume the problem is in the public's understanding. For me, as much of the effort needs to be directed towards improving economists' understanding of the public. There'd have been a better time for the profession to parachute down from its ivory tower and put in more grassroots effort engaging practically with real world problems in companies or charities or communities or societies. And like in the past, trust these days is no longer automatically endowed in centralized institutions like mine, be it companies or banks or governments or central banks. It needs instead to be earned individual by individual, company by company region by region, on a decentralized basis. And that means finding new ways of building trust, new media, and a new language. And look, many of us are making big efforts in that direction. There's doubtless much more still to be done to engender and build that decentralized trust. Finally, the third element of the critique is that the unelected technocrats, armed only with an economics degree, I think that means me, by the way, <laughs> are making essentially social and political choices. Um, one example, one given in the book, one given tonight, uh, one close to my own heart, is quantitative easing, so-called QE, which is often cited as having overtly distributional consequences. Now, some context here is really important, OK? Because the, the truth is, pretty much every act of public policy has distributional consequences. You know why I know that? Because that's how public policy works. That's what public policy is. It's about redistributing resources across people at a point in time or distributing resources across people over time. That's just what public policy does for a living, OK? So unless we want every arm of public policy to be attached to the body politic, something needs to give. So for me, policy decisions made at arm's length from the political process do have a key role to play in serving the long-term interests of society at large. Why do I say that? Because technocrats are, on average, less susceptible to political cycles and populist surges than are directly elected representatives of the people. That's why operational, keyword, operational independence in the setting of monetary policy continues to be seen internationally as best practice. Why? Why? Well, because political cycles and populist surges have in the past repeatedly led monetary policy astray. They've caused high inflations or hyperinflations that have exploded societies and damaged, in particular, the poor. And that's not a world we should be rushing back to, in my view. Thanks very much.